Hello, and welcome to Office Hours, where I answer your questions about weight and weight medicine. I'm Dr. Megan. I'm a board-certified physician in internal medicine, lifestyle medicine, and obesity medicine. And this is really important because I actually prescribe these medications all the time. I actually talk to patients about their weight all the time. I've helped hundreds of patients lose weight, and I'm here to help you too. So if you're confused about your weight, you've been on social media, you've heard a lot of things, and you want straight answers you're in the right place. As a caveat, before we get started, I can't answer personal medical questions because I'm not your personal doctor. So if your question does lean a little personal, I'm gonna change it slightly so it's more broadly educationally applicable. In addition, these questions come from the community. So if you have a question, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below, leave it on another video. I'll find it and add it to the list and let's get started. First question is, what would you personally tell a patient that has lost, who has lost 76 pounds and is 70 years old and has diabetes in the normal range about loose skin surgery. I'm in good health and get around as well as any younger patient. Do you think it is just as good a decision as somebody younger or harder on an older patient? That is a great question. Thank you so much for sending that in. Okay. So I've made videos in the past about loose skin after weight loss. And so you can definitely check that out afterwards. But in short, uh, for people who have lost a significant amount of weight, whether they're in their 20s, 30s, 60s, 70s, wherever they are, if they've lost a significant amount of weight, there's a very good chance that they may have some loose skin. And usually, uh, loose skin, the best way, the quickest way, the easiest way to fix it is not a supplement or a cream, um, but is to see a plastic surgeon and have it surgically removed. Now, I can't comment on anybody's particular surgical candidacy. That would be a question for the surgeon, but I do think for anybody at any age who is contemplating this, just know what your options are. I think it's a really good idea to if you have loose skin, if it bothers you, talk to your PCP or talk to your obesity doctor or talk to your dermatologist. Get a couple good names of some plastic surgeons and just have a conversation with them because you're not gonna get the surgery that day and you're not gonna get pushed out of the office, right? I think we have a lot of uh, like preconceived notions about what happens if you might consider this. And it's just, just find out what, all the information and then you can make a decision. And so it very well might be that there are patients in their 60s and 70s who are great candidates for surgery. Um, it depends on where the surgery, where the loose skin is. Of course, it depends on their medical history and all that. But people get surgery in their 70s. Um, and so it's really worth figuring out what it would entail, what the cost would be to you, what the recovery time would be. Just get the answer so then you can make an informed decision because I think a lot of times people s kind of sit and go around and around in circles like, should I do this? this? I don't know. It might not be a good idea. There's a lot of risks. Like, Just go see the surgeon. See a couple surgeons, find a couple that you like, find a couple that you click with and see what they say. And they may say, absolutely, this would be a great choice for you. They may say, hey, depend because of where the surgery would be, I don't think this is a good fit, but you just wanna get all the information and then you can make an informed decision. Now, there probably will be an out-of-pocket cost for that. And for a lot of people, it will be worth it to know. Um, so again, if that is not an impediment for somebody, I think it really is worth knowing what's out there, knowing what the options are. There may be a couple different surgeries that you would be a candidate for, um, depending on where the loose skin is. So um, I think you can't go wrong with more, the more information, the better. So great question. Thank you so much for asking that. I think a lot of people are going through the same thing right now. Um, next question. I'm seeing a lot of information regarding the GLP-1 pills versus injections. I don't know if this is reliable info, but apparently the injections work better for most. What is your take? Great question. And I think it's particularly confusing right at this 
moment at the time of filming in the fall of 2025 because things are a little in flux. So I will break it down for you very simply. Number one, there is no, at the time of this filming, there is no FDA approved pill for weight loss that is a GLP-1 medication. There is nothing that is approved. Number two, there is a GLP-1 pill that is approved for diabetes. It is called Ribelsis. It doesn't seem to get great results for weight loss, and it does seem to cause people a lot of side effects. Uh, I have seen this personally in the clinic when people try it for whatever reason, maybe they have diabetes, they wanna try this. I have never felt like it's been a good option for people who may qualify for it. It doesn't really achieve the goals in mind that we have for weight loss. Number three, there are GLP-1 pills that are on the horizon to be approved and probably will be available on the market in 2026. Right now it looks like two options, um, or forglipron, which is a small molecule GLP-1. Um, that will probably get approved and be available 2026. And the oral semaglutide ribelsis at a higher dose may get approved for weight loss. So to summarize, there's no pill available right now for weight loss, that's a GLP-1. Um, there are some that are on the horizon to be FDA approved soon. In terms of efficacy, from the data we have now, from all the medications that we have currently on the market, ZepBound is generally thought to be the most effective and seems to have the least amount of side effects. That is trizepatide and that is an injectable medication. And on average, people can expect to lose about, on average, 20% of their total body weight, which is amazing. Um, the pills in terms of orforglipron and semaglutide, they're not quite getting to that, but they are looking to be competitive with Wagovi. Wagovi, which is semaglutide, is an injectable, and that tends to get people to about 12 to 15% of total body weight loss. Now, there's more information that will be forthcoming. Maybe we have more data that suggests that the oral medications are consistently giving a more robust performance that is closer to that 20% um, 20 total body weight loss. But that's where we are right now. They seem to be competitive with Wagovi, not quite there in terms of ZepBound. If I wanted to get the most weight loss for somebody, I would still go with ZepBound. Um, and again, as always, your mileage may vary. So great question, thank you so much. Next question, what is your opinion on bupropion with ZepBound without the naltrexone component for women in perimenopause? Would this compound the weight loss effect of the terzepatide? I'm just gonna answer this a bit more broadly in terms of general weight loss. Um, so if somebody's on ZepBound for weight loss, and they would benefit from being on bupropion, which is an antidepressant, but is used in a variety of settings off-label. Um, I would expect them probably to lose an additional amount of weight loss, potentially. Um, bupropion and naltrexone can get people to maybe 5 to 10% total body weight loss. Again, my clinical experience is not as excited about it uh, as the oral pill of choice, but um, but in theory, it could be. And um, so I think uh, probably, so in general, bupropion tends to cause weight loss on its own. Uh, in general, naltrexone doesn't. So bupropion plus terzepatide, I would expect somebody might lose an additional amount of weight loss. It probably, I'm not expecting a lot, but I would not be surprised if they lost an additional, maybe, let's say three to 5%. Um, if they were on ZepBound and they added naltrexone, I'm really not expecting any additional weight loss. Um, but for whatever reason, when you combine bupropion with Naltrexone, you do tend to get to that five to seven to maybe 10% weight loss for some people. Um, so, but if you, if somebody just had terzepatide plus bupropion, 
Could you get some extra weight loss? Yes, I would not be surprised if that happened. Would it be a drastic amount? Probably not. Next question, I had my gallbladder removed after eight months on Munjaro due to gallstones. I started with five milligrams and went up to 15 milligrams, lost 30 plus kilos, congratulations. I stopped the Munjaro for two months after the surgery, but restarted at 15 milligrams again. Is being on the highest dose a problem for somebody with no gallbladder? That is a great question. Um, in general, if someone's recovered well and, you know, I'm not worried about the, uh, you know, post-op complications in terms of eating well, drinking well, they're, they got had their gallbladder out and now they're at their normal baseline um, in terms of just living their everyday life and I'm thinking about titrating them up on the medication. Um, no, I'm not really worried that because they don't have a gall, gallbladder that they can't go up to 15 milligrams. The only reason why it would be an impediment for somebody would be the same reason it would be an, an impediment for anybody else, which would be the side effects. So if somebody has their gallbladder out, they may have some digestive issues. They may have some diarrhea. And if that was a longstanding issue and their GLP-1 medication was compounding that, then that would complicate their trajectory. But if they weren't having any uh, bowel issues, um, then there was, and they don't have a gallbladder, um, then it's not a problem. So it really just comes down to side effects that they are having after the surgery and how much that's going to interfere with their progression on the weight medication. Now, for some people, uh, and this can be not, doesn't even have to be related to uh, gallbladder surgery, but some people have um, loose bowel movements. And then when they go on the GLP-1, it kind of fixes it. So that's also an option that's, you know, people don't always think of that sometimes these get things get better um, in some circumstances. So uh, again, it would depend on the side effects they were having after the surgery and if those side effects were worsened by the medication. But if everything's going well, usually I don't see any reason why somebody can't go up to the highest... Um, the highest level of Zepbound. If you, again, if you want to leave a question afterwards, you can definitely leave it on this video or another video and I will add it to the list. If you wanna work with me directly, I do work as a weight loss coach to help people with the non-medical aspects of their weight loss. People who are on a GLP-1 and they still can't get themselves to the gym or they still feel like they're not sure what to do with their food, it is not in a place where they want it to be. I help people with all of this and so much more. I've seen it all, I've heard it all. So I will leave all that info down below. Thank you so much for watching and please be well.